Hello, San Francisco. My name is Laura Rubin, and are you tired of startup stories? I'm sorry, because here's another. All right, so who here actually read the event invitation and uh, wondered what the hell is an addit? Anyone? Okay, at least one person. Okay, an addit is a horizontal mine shaft, and now you know. So imagine you are sitting at a bar in a city that's known for being the hub of, yes, it's the Comstock Saloon. It's very old timey. Imagine you're sitting in a bar in a city that's known for being a hub of new technology and finance. Some rich dude is sitting in a corner with some caviar and some champagne, and he's listening to a scruffy late 20-something pitching his side hustle. Listen, the first problem is access. Monetization writes itself. This isn't San Francisco, though our scruffy founder came from San Francisco and went there afterwards, and you're not listening to a digital tech startup, but the first modern startup. The place is Virginia City in what's now Nevada. The year is 1860. Uh, for reference, Prince Albert is still alive. Lincoln has just been elected president. Nevada is still part of Utah. Won't be its own state until 1864. Maps, maps. Thank you. And another one. And the population of San Francisco is a whopping 56,000. It's like just that bit. It's the height of the silver boom in the Comstock load. And while Virginia City now is more like Disneyland for clampers and Hell's Angels and history nerds, it was once a town where the streets were literally paved with silver. Um, it turns out that when you're mining for gold, there's this blue stuff in Nevada that gets in the way of the gold. And it turns out that they didn't realize that it was silver ore until they kind of chucked it all over the streets. Yeah, turns out it's, uh, it's sulfide of silver. So in the 1860s, Virginia City was the place to be. It attracted a lot of writers and engineers and technologists. This is Edison. He came and put an electri electricity system. Um, a lot of mine designers. Uh, Mark Twain was writing there for the Virginia City newspaper. And it also attracted some rich assholes. <laughs> if you recognize these people, then you are a bigger nerd than me. <laughs> these are two of the bankers of the Bank of California. Um, so by the 1860s, the blue stuff had been pulled up and refined, and deep mines had been sunk searching for more. But it turns out the Nevada ranges are all geothermal, so the mines were really, really hot, like up to 150 degrees. Uh, they were threatened by sudden breakthroughs into underground reservoirs and scalding seams of, uh, of hot, uh, hot water. They're choked by toxic fumes, and so just generally not a good place to work, especially if you're wearing full-on Victorian clothing. So imagine now doing like hard physical labor in Victorian clothing in a steamy carbide lamp lit Swedish sauna. So these guys are pretty tough, but they're not that tough. And worse, they can't breathe underwater. So the mine owners are constantly fighting the rising waters in the mines, and so they invest huge sums of money in other startups to bring steam pumps and men to run them and men to build cooler steam pumps. And even then, that was not enough to keep the water out of the mine so they could keep digging. Something had to be done. So that conversation that we're overhearing is between a desperate mine owner and a promising young businessman named Adolf Sutro, age 29. Sutro had been part of a prosperous family who owned a cloth factory. He'd been sent to uh, engineering school so he could learn how to do the machines, but then they refugeed to uh, the Americas um, after the revolutions. <laughs> and they moved to uh, Baltimore, of all places. Um, but <laughs> a few months after they moved to Baltimore, uh, Sutro found out about the gold rush and hightailed it to San Francisco. He went there not to dig originally, but to sell things to the miners. You know what they say, in a gold rush, sell shovels. He'd become really successful by the time he heard about the Comstock load in uh, 1859, and smelling opportunity somehow over the cigar smoke that he was uh, selling, he headed out to Virginia City. His idea was this. The mines were pretty high up on Mount Davidson in Virginia City. He'd drill a tunnel all the way from the level of the mines down to the valley floor, like drilling a hole in a barrel um, and letting gravity do all the rest to pull the water out. Yeah, makes sense, right? 
Science, <laughs> gravity. So while he was at it, he was gonna run some tracks up the tunnel and let gravity also carry the ore down because right now you had to dig it up and then pull it out of the mine. Um, the mine owners could subscribe to the tunnel services. They could pay either per cartload of ore or per day of water pumping. And it was gonna be really expensive, but it was gonna be wildly profitable, so they're raising capital by selling shares of stock in the Sutro Tunnel Company. Once the tunnel was finished, the shares would be sold for profit in the public market. So we got subscription services, we've got stock, we've got IPO. Sound familiar? <laughs> so by 1864, the plan's in motion, but not without resistance. So the Bank of California, uh, partly controlled by those two assholes I mentioned earlier, um, was originally going to finance the venture, but then realized that it had a vested interest in maintaining railroad mo monopolies and not letting Sutro take ore down some railroad tunnel. Um, and so they removed their support. So Sutro like, was looking for government financing. He's like taking them to court. He's you know, going to Europe and buttering up random you know, nobles to get financing. Um, and eventually, in 1869, there was a huge fire at the Yellow Jacket Mine in Virginia City. It killed 45 miners. They were trapped uh, by water and by, by uh, the smoke. And Sutro saw this as his chance. So with banners and speeches, he kind of made it almost like a unionization uh, movement. He pitched the Sutro Tunnel Project as an improvement in mine safety, in mine safety directly to the workers. And they then took their demands to the mine owners. It worked. Work finally began in November of 1869, 10 years after the scheme was first proposed. And Sutro had made this plan so popular with the miners that he was able to pay the men their, their, their normal wage of $4 a day, $3 in cash, and $1 in stock certificates. In effect, <laughs> pioneering the very first employee stock options. So before I continue, I need to talk about like, some visual aids to understand the scale of this tunnel project. The Sutro Tunnel was four miles long and 1,700 feet tall. So to put that into perspective, the Salesforce Tower is, as far as the internet can tell me, uh, 1,070 feet tall. So to, to start, we have to give it like a really big hat. And because, you know, whatever, Robert Barron's, we're gonna give it a monocle too. And that gets us to 1,700 feet. So then if you imagine that someone dug a, a tunnel from the top of that hat on top of the Salesforce Tower, imagine, just imagine the tunnel all the way to the Alameda Naval Base, like probably somewhere around the St. George Distillery. That is how long this tunnel is. There's also the possibility you could have driven it west towards Mountain Lake, but that's another water tunnel stock story. Ask me later. So. Did it go as planned? It totally did. Construction started in 1869, uh, and in 1878, Sutro himself placed the last explosive charge. He was known as the weirdo who was both financing the mine, managing the, uh, <laughs> financing the tunnel, managing the tunnel, and placing explosive charges, a man I enjoy. <laughs> he placed that last, uh, that last explosive uh, and connected it with the Savage Mine. 18 years after he first proposed the plan, the tunnel was drawing up to 4 million gallons of water out each day. But was it a success? About a year after completion, Sutro quietly sold all of his stock and moved back to San Francisco. In the time he'd spent fighting the monopolists and the bankers, the Comstock load had actually begun to play out. So although the mine owners were paying the company about $10,000 a day, when the tunnel first opened, a mere three years later, the mines had stopped running their pumps, and eight years later, the final one closed its doors. They actually allowed the water to just fill up the mines and then drain passively out the tunnel for free. What are you gonna do, stop it? By then, the writing was on the wall. Sutro's mansion, he had like strapped it to the hill because it was very windy there. It was in ruins. Everyone had left and it was abandoned. So the tunnel mouth actually still exists. This whole thing is still there and still draining water. If you look at this on Google Maps, you can actually see this giant pond where all the mine water is going. <laughs> well, I, didn't, I didn't grab that one. So for those of you who've been with, with us here for a while, did any of you remember uh, Odd Salon Cursed years ago? 
I'm going to remind you of something that I like to call Schrodinger's dick bag. <laughs> Although Sutro clearly made out like a robber baron and took advantage of his laborers and partners alike with stock schemes, he was by all accounts a kind, benevolent man who did not give a shit about where you were from or how much money you had. On the other hand, he took his Comstock fortune, left investors holding the bag, and bought 10% of San Francisco by area and secured his fortune with real estate speculation. Boo. He built himself a huge, luxurious mansion and a huge library like you do. And then he went like a weirdo and devoted himself to the wholesome entertainment of the working people. Cool. He built first a public aquarium and then the public natatorium, which is the fancy word for the Sutro baths that you can see still in ruins at Land at Land's End. He was a tireless philanthropist and an anti-monopolist. He never, never gave up fighting those assholes who had uh, blocked his project. And when those rail concerns started buying up trolley lines in San Francisco, they actually refused to allow people to take a single fare all the way from downtown San Francisco to the beach. So Sutro has, at this point in his life, what we would like to call in startup land, fuck you money. And he literally built his own trolley line to serve the baths. So that's right, folks. We've now heard of spite houses and spite fences. And now we also have a spite trolley line. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. He planted eucalyptus forests on Mount Parnassus, now known as Mount Sutro. He promoted the creation of parks for recreation of the public. And he also turned Sutro Heights mansion grounds into a public park. But a cynic could also say that the trolley was a good business move, that the parks weren't taxed, uh, anything that was forested was not uh, considered a real estate holding, and any of this could have also been considered sort of sketchy legal dealings. So like so much of history, judgment is left as an exercise to the reader. But good or bad, he had this really exciting lifelong obsession with tunnels and water, and after the Sutro Tunnel in Nevada, he actually built the waterworks for the Sutro Baths using a system of pumps and tunnels to bring in fresh seawater. He's very into tunnels. And a lesser known prospecting tunnel when they found coal on his, uh, prospe uh, in his land at Land's End. So I'd like to wrap up with a toast to Adolf Sutro. Nerdy, weirdo, startup founder with successful exits, obsessed with tunnels, Eat your heart out, Elon Musk. 